All right. Well, hopefully we've got everyone in the room here. We're not going to spend a ton of time on introductions, but we're very excited to have Lizanne Saunders here from uh, Schwab. She's the chief investment strategist and probably deserves no introduction. You see her on CNBC and Bloomberg uh, every other day. We've got a lot to cover, a lot of things going on in the markets today. So first off, Lizanne, thanks so much for being here. Oh, my pleasure. Thanks for having me. Looking forward to our conversation. So why don't we start with some of the hot topics here? Let's start with the R word, uh, you know, recession. So I know you've been re-educating uh, consumers that, you know, just a pair of negative GDP prints does not technically mean a recession. Um, but nonetheless, we've certainly seen a slowing economy. So first off, what is your view? Are we in a recession or not? And then practically, what does that matter or mean for investors? First of all, I think your second question is arguably even more important than the first question. I, I think if, if you asked me that question, and it was January 3rd of this year, and we were at all-time highs in the market, and the most recent GDP print was strongly positive, I think the conversation would matter a bit more, the distinction of recession versus not a recession. Now we've had or are still in a bear market. We have two quarters in a row of negative GDP, not the definition of a re recession, but a pretty good snapshot of weak growth. So whether ultimately it's declared a recession at this stage in the game, I'm not sure matters to a significant degree. Uh, you know, I, the, the notion that the strong jobs report that was announced on Friday completely dispels the notion of a recession suggests you're not a student of, of history and how recessions unfold and the coincident nature of payrolls, the lagging nature of the unemployment rate. Um, and the importance of the other survey, the household survey, which is showing less robust uh, data, not to mention unemployment claims up 50% from their lows. So I, th I think the needle is pointing more in the direction of recession, but it's a long lag between starts and ends. And when the NBER announces that we're in one, announces the start date, and then announces uh, subsequently the end date. So yeah. from an investor perspective, that's the worst thing you can do is sort of wait for it to be official. You you will have missed probably both the move down and the move back up. <laughs> yeah, exactly right. So to your point on the labor market, I think you know that is one of the things the Fed is certainly grappling with as they're trying to uh, tackle inflation. And that kind of brings us to our next dirty word is the I word inflation. So we had a CPI print uh, this week, you know, showing some moderating inflation, certainly on the headline, though core inflation still remains fairly robust, especially around uh, rents and owner owner equivalent rents. So what are your views on kind of inflation and where we are in the inflation cycle and kind of the transitory versus persistent camps? So, you know, transitory, I'm, I'm sure the Fed every day regrets the utilization of that word and putting it in print in the, the statements. But the reality is, if you look up, I don't know, the Oxford Dictionary definition of transitory, it's a really simple definition of not permanent. So even the Fed could go back at some point probably and say, well, it was transitory. It's just the, the span of time was a bit longer than, than we or anybody else thought at the time. We are starting to see um, a, a little bit of a move uh, down or at least a, a, a peak. But I think important is not so much headline versus core, more important is goods versus services because it was the good side of the economy that was both the boom from a demand standpoint and sowed the seeds of the inflation problem we have now because it was coupled with the absence of supply because of supply chain disruptions. All of that was heavily concentrated on the good side. And we are seeing relief uh, there. However, I think the, the cheering of yes, inflation is peak, this means the Fed can take their foot off the brake. I, I think there's too much complacency around that. The Fed has been really clear, pretty much every member, every talking head, has said it's not just about a peak and a tick down. Powell has used the term series. He wants to see a series of lower readings. Loretta Mester has used several months. But the fact that they continually also talk about getting inflation back to a 2% target, a downtick from you know, 9.1 to 8.7, that, that's there's a long way to go. Even if, and I just put this chart out on Twitter, even if we had zero inflation, absolutely none, from this point to the end of the year, highly unlikely, but let's just say there was none. On a year-over-year -year basis, by year-end, inflation would be down to 
if we go to kind of pre-COVID uh, or even post-COVID trends, it, it's only down to about 6%. So the Fed may be able to move away from being as aggressive as they have been with 75 basis point hikes, but this notion that they can quickly just pull their foot completely off the break. And if by pivot, you think that means shift to rate cuts, I think we're still a long way uh, off. I, I think we have work to do, not to mention the fact that some of where inflation has been higher are the what they call the stickier components, like the shelter components, owner's equivalent rent, rent of primary residence, some of the food related inflation. And uh, so I think there's gonna be offsets to some of the areas where we are likely to see disinflation um, in many cases, which has already kicked in. Yeah, it's it's easy to forget. It's not just the rate of change of inflation, but inflation is also a level, right? right? So your point on coming back down, there's a real long way between eight, seven and two. Yep. But you know, I know we've talked uh, and you've talked in the past about kind of uh, analogous or allegory periods in history of which, you know, the Fed is largely using kind of the 70s, 80s Volcker playbook on fighting inflation. Yeah. But entering into this cycle, you know, we were really coming into this in a minimum inflation, minimum volatility, minimum yield, and maximum accommodation through fiscal and monetary policies. So as the punch bowl is pulled back on a lot of those, um, are there analogous periods in history of which we could look to, you know, hopefully read tea leaves? And what does that mean, do you think, for investors around kind of now the shift into QT, now the shift into, you know, less accommodative policies? So I think there are an analogous eras, and I think the 70s into the early 80s is probably one, except I think there are um, quite a few really important differences uh, in terms of the 1970s versus the current environment. Um, globalization, the nature of globalization, demographics looked a lot different. The, the bias in the economy toward the manufacturing side versus the consumer side, the uh, greater unionization and the, the bargaining power that that labor had. So it's not it, it's not a it, it's not a pure match to what's going on in the 1970s. And I don't think ultimately the Fed is going to have to pull out truly the, the Volcker playbook and um, you know, bring interest rates up into double digit uh, territory. Um, there's also um, there's similarities to the post-World War II period of time in terms of what represented, it was a sort of a wartime, which the pandemic you could argue was sort of a healthcare version of, of wartime. And then what came out of that in terms of the surge in demand and where stimulus was and trying to match that demand. So I, I do think though that the, the era of um, disinflation, the great moderation period, really the 20 years that predated the pandemic, I don't think we're going back to that environment. I think the environment we're in is one where inflation, even when the plane lands, is at a higher elevation in general. I also think there we're in a period now where there's likely to be more economic volatility. And what characterized the period really from the 60s, 70s, and 80s was more economic volatility, shorter cycles, meaning more recessions, but maybe also importantly, greater growth spurts coming out of those recessions. The great moderation also saw a moderation in economic growth where we just didn't have that. The last expansion pre-COVID was the longest in history. That's great, but it was also the weakest by far in history. Not so great. So I think more volatility, but bigger moves on the uh, upside. And I think one proxy for that would be the relationship between bond yields and stock prices. For 30 years, uh, we had up until around the mid 1990s, bond yields and stock prices were inversely correlated. Um, it made diversification a little trickier. Then for the 20 years pre-COVID, they were positively correlated because we didn't have an inflation problem. So when yields were going up, it was typically a signal of stronger growth without inflation risk. That's a great backdrop for the equity market. When yields are going up because it's an inflation problem and isn't really a growth story, that's more negative for the equity market. So I think that will be one of the quantifiable tells if it sustains itself that we are indeed in sort of a new, more like 60s, 70s, 80s regime than 90s into pre-pandemic. Yeah. And speaking of shifting regimes, you know, there's been 
a lot of geopolitical headlines, certainly uh, late out of China. But if we kind of step back and we think about the area of uh, the era of which you just mentioned, kind of globalization, seeking low cost producers globally, offshoring. Uh, now we we do seem to have a bit more of a secular opportunity of kind of an East and West or NATO, non-NATO uh, retracing of supply lines, trying to build more resiliency uh, rather than just simply lowest cost. Do you think that that adds further fodder to this kind of idea of uh, potentially greater volatility and uh, and and influence in market behavior? I do. I think it adds to um, macro related geopolitical related volatility. and it's it's much more complicated than just we went from an era of globalization to now deglobalization. I don't think that's what's happening. You're not seeing it in the data that actually tracks that. You're not seeing it in in, in global trade figures. However, I think more diversified supply chain is one of the lessons learned from the uh, COVID area, um, not putting all your eggs in one low cost basket or lo one sort of low cost region. And so I think that there's opportunities that come about from that, but it's more about diversifying within this ongoing theme of, of globalization and a shift maybe from just in time to now some just in case so that we don't have the inventory swings that we've seen in the last couple of years. I also think that we're, although I've consistently been a big believer that that the United States, the dollar is the world's reserve currency and will stay as if you wanted to use the, the world's reserve currency. However, I think we're growing to an, into an environment where there will be multiple reserve currencies, maybe more in regional blocks. Even if the dollar retains its status as the monetary standard, I think that could contribute to economic volatility, plus the fact that there's more weaponization of a lot of different things. We're seeing that in terms of, of what's happened with the war and the, the sanctions on oligarchs. And, and you know, so that there's weaponization by lots of regions and lots of countries in, in many different aspects. And it's hard to argue that that dampens volatility. I think that that probably is additive to volatility, which in turn probably means maybe a higher plane for market volatility in uh, in general. Yeah, and your point on kind of just in time to just in case and the ultimate landing zone for inflation, right? It's less likely to see that one, two, you know, right. sub three levels of inflation if you want resiliency, because resiliency is gonna cost something and it's right. probably gonna pass to the consumer. Um, and you sorry. could get you could get down to that if the Fed maintains this aggressive stance. I just don't think if we get there, we stay there. I, right. I think the swings in inflation are likely to be wider than the minimal swings we got it during the Great Moderation, where for 20 years the CPI report no nobody cared about. There wasn't the bug flashing on Bloomberg and CNBC. There wasn't the breathless reporting at 8:30. But uh, yeah, I inflation think... was a word that fell out of investor lexicon. I mean, it was I... not even a, a consideration. But right. now it's clearly, unfortunately, has to be at the front line of the Fed. Um, so I failed to mention it just due to excitement to get into our conversation. But if you have questions along the way, put them in the chat. I've seen we already have a couple that have come in, but we'll try to answer those along the way. Um, just put them in the chat queue and we'll we'll address them as we go. So Lizanne, let's shift a little bit uh, kind of from the 50,000 foot level on kind of markets economies and talk a little bit more uh, specifically, maybe about earnings in particular. Um, you know, it does seem with the Fed on its march against inflation where multiples are at best going to be under pressure um, or, or flat. Um, so that it leaves a lot more focus on earnings and earnings resiliency and, and beats. But Sell side expectations for calendar year as of June 30 were still at 9.7. They finally started coming down in July. I think they're around 8.9 now. Um, but what is your outlook for corporate earnings? And do you think current expectations are setting us up for disappointments? I do think the, the out quarters, including the second half of this year and into 2023, uh, I think those estimates still have to come down a bit. And they have started to trend down, to your point. Um, once we started reporting season, which overall for the second quarter was pretty decent. Um, although not record-breaking beat rate, you know, a lower percent by which companies uh, beat expectations both on earnings and revenues. 
Um, we are starting to see a rolling over in forward-looking profit margin expectations and the dollar amount of, of S&P earnings, which is, of course, the denominator in the PE, have rolled over for the second half of the year and into 2023. But I think there's probably more to go on the downside. From a valuation perspective, I think there's we've already been in two phases. I think phase one, which really saw the bear market erupt, was a necessary re-rating overall evaluations given what was happening with inflation and interest rates. So it was very much an inflation, higher rates, higher discount rate, future earnings are worth less. Phase two then became reflecting the weakness in the economy. I think those phases are largely behind us, but the phase yet to come is the deterioration in the E. And then you have to bring back in the macro environment of where are rates going, where is inflation going to ultimately figure out, okay, what's what's called fair value, given that we now have the E moving potentially in the opposite direction of the way it's been moving for the past couple of, of years. So I don't think we're out of the woods yet in terms of, of whatever we settle down to from a multiple perspective. The market's a lot less expensive than it was two years ago, but uh, certainly is not screaming, uh, this is a cheap market historically. Sure, and that's a perfect transition into kind of the, the recent rhetoric around, are we in a bear market rally? Um, I think Jeffrey's actually had a great note out recently on kind of the, the move since mid-June. It's a two standard deviation for, uh, for a uh, weak move where that's happened 17 times over the last 32 years. And when it's uh, followed by kind of a, a weak market preceding it, the probability of it being kind of a bear market rally is far higher. So what are your views on kind of, as you set up those three conditions and the E is next to come, uh, you know, is this a head fake or could this be more sustainable? So I don't, I, I don't make it a habit of trying to precisely time market bottoms and tops. I think that's a fool's errand and I'm not sure that messaging is of great value, especially to individual in investors. I think there's disciplines that come into play more than trying to pick tops and bottoms. That's just sort of gambling on moments in time. But to, to put on my sort of technicians, internals cap on, um, this rally has had uh, significantly better breadth statistics than the couple uh, bear market rallies that preceded it. Those to me at that time looked very obviously like bear market rallies. This one has looked a bit healthier. However, some of the drivers of it have been way down the quality spectrum. So we're seeing that speculation kick back in, especially among retail traders. And you've seen a massive surge in the meme stocks and the non-profitable areas and the heavily shorted stocks. Um, sometimes that's a message of a coming pickup in the economy. You go down the quality spectrum. We saw that when we got the vaccine news that started to come in in late 2020 and the market started pricing in a, not just a pickup in growth, but a real surge. That's when you want to go into the lower quality because that's where the leverage is. I think, again, to use a trader's term, I think you want to fade, so to speak, the low quality stuff and more lean into the higher quality stuff. I, Time will tell whether this is a sign of a new bull market. Uh, if you're using simple 20% definitions, the NASDAQ's in a new bull market because it's up 20% from the low, but that happened several times between 2000 and 2002, and they were fake outs, as we know, with the benefit of hindsight. S&P is still not only below its 200-day moving average, but that average is still moving down. It would be somewhat unique historically for this to be a new bull market without those uh, having shifted. Now we could be on our way to that, but so I, I think it's a mixed picture right now. I don't think it's a conclusive one way or the other. Yeah, fair. And to your point on the recent rally has had more breadth and has been a little bit different. There's also been a shift in leadership, you know, certainly year to date and over the last year, energy materials or uh, I guess current earnings and inflation sensitive businesses have, have succeeded in those largely in technology or healthcare, higher multiple businesses and farther out earnings have, have really been hurt. But we've seen that shift pretty meaningfully uh, recently. Do you view that as kind of part of that shift in sentiment that you said, you know, kind of shifting to, you know, lower quality, or is that something more meaningful and material in your view? So the real low quality stuff, like the memes and heavily shorted, I think that's more of a Reddit, Wall Street bets, 
fueling the sure. retail trader. That that's just kind of a different cohort, and I'm not sure is reflective what's going on. What does concern me a little bit is when I look at a sector like utilities that has done so well. Um, utilities are considered you know, value stocks. They live in the value indexes, but they're now significantly more expensive than the overall S&P. That doesn't make them growth stocks. It just makes them expensive stocks that live in the value indexes. I think the shift toward more growth type factors that are working has to do with economic growth having come down so much. So when there's less broad growth in the economy, where you can find growth tends to trade at a premium. And the shift from sort of value factors to growth factors was representative of that shift from inflation as a focus, rates going up to, uh-oh, now growth is in focus. And that's natural then to see a shift from value factors working to growth factors working. I think this is a time in the cycle where you want to take a hybrid approach. We've been recommending more of a factor-based approach than just trying to pick a sector or two, or or even worse, just saying I'm going to be in the growth indexes or the value indexes. But look for a combination, quality wrapper, you know, strong free cash flow, strong return on equity, healthy balance sheet, but strong profitability, positive earnings revisions. So a collection of those growth and value factors with a quality wrapper around them, I think is the best way to navigate this type of environment. And to your point on some of the rudimentary indices, right? I think those investors that are following that approach, you know, maybe a word of warning in the reconstitution that happened, you know, a lot of shift actually meta, you know, Facebook is, it's now a value stock, interestingly enough. So, or, or the shift doesn't happen. Like I said, right. just because utilities are expensive doesn't mean Russell moves them into the growth indexes. They're, they're not growth stocks. They're just expensive stocks that live in the value indexes. Sure. Energy has been the strongest growth sector for a couple of years now from an earnings growth perspective. They still largely live in the value indexes. That doesn't mean you don't find growth in there. So right. focus on the characteristics more so than just putting blinders on and just you know picking the index just yeah. because it's defined as growth or value. Sure, fair enough. We've gotten a lot of questions kind of zooming back out on um, geopolitical and uh, other tensions globally in the chat queue. So maybe I'll, I'll wrap some of those together to try to address a lot of those. So one of them is just related to Russia. And in particular, um, has the market begun to ignore the Russian conflict um, as it's been normalized in, in daily activity? Obviously, it was such a shocking event yeah. at one point, but now have we have we normalized it and are we ignoring it? I don't think we're ignoring it. It's not the the short term day to day volatility driver that it was at the outset of the war, but I think it still very much comes into the mix when assessing the likelihood of of recession or significant growth deterioration, particularly in places like Europe that are at the mercy of what Russia is doing with the supply chain of energy and even food. So I think it's still very much in the picture and in, in in assessing just the landscape for the economy in those regions that are most closely tied to um, energy and food trade. But the day-to-day -day market can swing on either an, you know, a heating Missile up of escalations or, yeah. or some sign that you know they're meeting to potentially negotiate some sort of uh, ceasefire. Yeah, I think that that's not a that, that's not a needle mover right now, but it's uh, it, it hasn't disappeared as an important force. Maybe tying your comments on food to other geopolitical instability, we got a question on kind of Sri Lanka and Pakistan um, and kind of looming EM concerns. Are there structural concerns that especially in some of these emerging markets with maybe greater or few, uh, less disposable income where food becomes yeah. a very regressive tax. Do you view yeah. that as kind of a, a thread to pull on throughout or are some of these like Sri Lanka? All uh, you have to do event? is look at history of famines and food shortages and, and see how they can turn into much bigger um, geopolitical crises within those regions, not to mention what has been until very recently extraordinary strength in, in the dollar and the impact that that has on, on emerging market reserves. Now, I would also, though, say I don't think we can generalize or look at emerging markets in a monolithic way. 
A lot of it depends on, are you on the production side of commodities? Are you on the consumption side of commodities? Either way, which commodities, what are your trade ties? What's your reserve situation? So I think that it, certainly in emerging markets, it requires more of an, a, an active approach in understanding the internal dynamics of, of each region. But do I expect more volatility and more disruption and more, um, you know, masses rise up against the establishment? Uh, yeah, I, I think we're probably just seeing some of the beginning of that. Then I, our, our kind of final question in the queue around this geopolitical side and, and perhaps maybe tied to food or food instability is just around population growth and long term. And we see a lot of countries, including here in the U.S., but Japan, China and others um, with slowing or low population growth. Yeah. What do you think that that does to kind of those long term investors trying to reconcile kind of some of those big long term arcing concerns and, and more current opportunity? So I think it probably means that debt levels aren't going down anytime soon because of the necessity of government funding of the aging population and everybody's structure is a, a bit different, but it's certainly one of the reasons why there's ongoing debates of, of how we deal with, with Social Security and Medicare and unfunded entitlements here. And it'd be a different story if our population trajectory was much healthier. That said, relative to a a good chunk of the rest of the world, the United States doesn't look so bad. In a place like China, um, the the breakdown from an age bracket perspective and a gender perspective is pretty dire. And in fact, I think that alone is reason to believe that China is not going to do something like invade Taiwan um, for the simple reason that they can't afford to lose a lot of their prime age males um, in a war. Uh, that doesn't mean they're not going to uh, approach this as an economic war and, and do whatever they're going to do relative to Taiwan, relative to the U.S., but I think an actual military war is unlikely in large part due to the unique demographics. And then you've got opportunities that come in places like parts of the Middle East, more, more importantly, maybe in Africa, where their demographics are in great shape and may really provide an opportunity in terms of, of global trends for, for investment, for creativity. So it, it's not all a, a negative story, but it's just a, it's, it's a changing story, certainly from the 1970s, when one of what the reasons why we fueled the inflation that we had was because we had massive population growth, a massive influx of people into kind of prime age uh, working years, clearly not the case now and different drivers of inflation now than then. Fair. So looking at the clock here, uh, maybe kind of final thoughts on volatile markets, volatile time, lots of headlines. What would be your main takeaway for investors here and just the best ways to successfully navigate a market like this? Um, understand that. Um, you know, investing should be a disciplined process over time, should never be about moments in time. The The whole notion of one of the most popular questions I get from the media, especially when markets are more volatile, is, okay, Lizanne, are you telling your investors to get in or get out? Um, neither get in or get out is an investing strategy. That's just, again, gambling on a moment in time, and investing should always be a disciplined process over time. And volatility also is, is uncomfortable, but it provides the advantage in the sense that rebalancing gives you an opportunity to take advantage of swings in both directions and, and forces us, re, the, the beautiful discipline of rebalancing forces investors to do what we know we're supposed to, which is not so much buy low, sell high, but add low, trim high. And often when left to our own devices, we tend to do uh, the opposite when the emotions uh, kick in. So it's boring to talk about diversification and rebalancing, but man, it's it, it's the closest thing you get to a free lunch. <laughs> are Boring those, is beautiful, are right? like that. <laughs> and that's yeah. what matters. Exactly. Well, Lizanne, we're at the top of the half hour. Thank you so much. We My really pleasure. appreciate your time and insights. Um, and as always, you know, we, we really value our partnership with you. So thank you so much. I if there are any questions left over, please feel free to reach out to us here at Fiducian. We're happy to uh, either circle with Lizanne or get back to you directly. So thanks so much for joining us and have a great rest of the week.